This mini PC has four two and a half gig ethernet ports, a brand new eight core processor that is super low power, and it runs just about everything you can imagine in such a tiny package that it looks about the scale of a Lego figurine. If you want a tiny low power server, this might be the best option out there. So well, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the iCool Core R2. It is absolutely tiny, low power and packed with features. Now you might be thinking, hey, didn't we see this already on STH? We did do the previous generation iCool Core R1. We did a video, an article on that. We also reviewed the iCool Core R1 Pro and showed the upgrade kit. And we also had that one in a cameo in another video. But this one is so much different. I said, nope, we got to do another video again. And that's what we're going to do today. Inside this is an Intel Core i3 N300 processor, which is super low power, but it also has eight cores. To go along with the eight cores, we have four two and a half gig ethernet ports. We have an NVMe SSD. We have Wi-Fi in this one, although that's an option. And it's all in this little tiny itty bitty package. And before we get to the hardware overview, I just want to say thank you to all the STH YouTube members. You're going to see some stuff on the new set, which was made possible by those that subscribe. So if you can help, we'll definitely do that down below. And I do want to point out that the iCool Core team did send this unit, but they do not get to review this. They don't even get to know if we we're going to do a video or not. They just send the unit and we get to produce whatever the heck we want out of it. But I do think these systems are super cool. So when I heard it was available, I said, yes, let's go do one. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so taking a look at the outside of the unit, there are definitely some things that are very similar to the R1 Pro, but there are also some things that are very different and I'm not 100% sure if I like them better or not. Let's start out with the front of the system and you're gonna see that we have two USB ports and a little power button, just like we did in the previous generation. Now, something I just wanna point out real quick is that when you take the system apart, if you do decide to take the system apart, the little power button just falls out. So you gotta be a little bit careful when you do that. Now, moving to the other side, you're gonna see that we have just our label and this is very similar to the R1 Pro label, but not necessarily the same as the R1. One. This is an area that's been upgraded. You'll also see that we have a giant vent on the bottom and we're gonna get to that when we get to the inside of the system. Now flipping this around, you're gonna see that we have two USB type C port looking things. And the first one is a USB 3 port, but it's also a display port type 1.4A. Now the other side is something that's very different in this generation versus the previous generation. So you're gonna see that we have a combo audio jack that's in a USB C port, interesting. But on the previous generation, we had a TF slot, which is basically a micro SD card slot. So so maybe if you're using this as a desktop, then maybe that makes sense, but I'm not really 100% sure that a lot of folks are gonna use an audio or a combo audio jack out of a USB-C port. Okay, now flipping this around, we get to the part that I think everybody wants to see. We get three 2.5 gigabit ethernet ports. Now these are all Intel i226V ports, which is pretty standard, but this generation, there's something that's a little bit different. That is the fourth two and a half gig ethernet port, which is a Realtek port. So it's not an Intel port. And that Realtek port isn't just like a standard RTL 8125 or something like that. Instead, it's an RTL 8156 BG, which means that it's actually a USB three NIC that's embedded in a system to get the fourth NIC. Now, of course, having four network ports is awesome if you're going to run this as a firewall. If you're going to run PFSense, OPNSense, something like that, that's always great. Also, if you're going to use it as a virtualization host, like for Proxmox VE or VMware or something like that, I think that's also pretty useful just having more NICs. But for a lot of folks, one or two NICs is going to be fine. And so I don't know how I feel about adding a fourth NIC using USB, right? Now, there definitely are some other features on the back of the system. We get an HDMI 2 port. So that's always kind of nice if you want to run like a 4K display off of this, you totally can. But the other thing that you can do is you you can power this via USB-C, but there's definitely a catch. So kind of first off, this is the power adapter, which is the USB-C, it's a 12 volt adapter. And I know a lot of folks are gonna say like, hey, cool that you have a 12 volt adapter, but I'd rather go and you know use my own power adapter instead of this little power adapter, that's totally fine. Um, but th this cable comes with the system. Now this is a USB-C to just kind of like a DC barrel jack. So if you wanna use a more standard type of power supply, then you would plug this into the USB-C port and now you have your adapter. I guess that's an okay solution. I just think that a lot of folks are gonna want either a kind of standard USB PD solution or they're gonna want a, um, you know, just a standard power jack, a DC in jack, right? And before we wrap up our external overview, I wanna just show you guys how small this is and why it's important, right? This is something that you can throw in your backpack if you are traveling or something like that and it's not gonna take up a whole lot of space. Like this is a Project Tiny Mini Micro one liter node from Lenovo and you can kind of see this thing is, uh, this thing is way, way bigger than the iCool Core R2, right? The other thing is though, is if you are gonna use multiple units, we'll 
use this R1 Pro as kind of our second unit, right? Like this is a cluster that is super small. So you can imagine that if you wanted to have like three of these units and you wanted to have like maybe a small switch or something like that, you could go and create a pretty cool little travel cluster. So there are a lot of folks that do things like sales, there are FAEs and stuff like that, or people that have to go and like set things up remotely and they just need a little mini cluster. Um, you know, this is a pretty powerful solution, right? You can get a bunch of ports, a bunch of network ports, a bunch of nodes and stuff like that all in a very tight package. And I think that's one of the reasons that you would buy something like the R2 is just to be able to travel with it and go on the road. And by the way, this is a cool Hazavo switch that we're gonna have a review of soon with four two and a half gig ethernet ports. It also has an SFP plus port and it has a 10 G base T port. There are management options, PoE options, all kinds of stuff like that. And we're gonna have a review of this pretty soon. Still, I think it's probably worth getting inside the unit so you can see how this thing is made. Okay, so getting inside the system, if you just wanna to get to the SSD, let's start with that because I think that's kind of the easiest. So what you have here is you have four pegs that go into this top and then you can pull the top off like this. Now something that the iCool Core folks did between like the R1 and R1 Pro version is they started adding and making this uh, this top piece like a little heat sink. So you see a little thermal pad here and that's really to cool the SSD. Now getting to the SSD, you can see we have the SSD here and this is a M.2 22 42, so a 42 millimeter SSD. It does not take a full 80 millimeter SSD because that just wouldn't fit in the system. Now, of course, with this, you can do a couple things. Like one, you can get these systems as a bare bones, so you don't have to get an SSD with it. There's 256 gig, 512. I think they also have a uh, one terabyte and they used to have at least, or they may have in the future, a two terabyte option as well. The big thing, however, with M.2 2242 drives is that you're not gonna get like the best performance because usually you're gonna see that these are single package drives. So you're gonna have like DRAM-less drives. You're just not gonna get a ton of performance. And so that's just something to keep in mind that if you do need like a ton of storage performance, these are NVMe drives, but they're not necessarily gonna be like the fastest NVMe drives just because of the form factor. Okay, now underneath the SSD, we get something new for this generation, which is a Wi-Fi slot. You just couldn't put a internal Wi-Fi card in the previous generation R1 and R1 Pros. And so now you have the option to do that. And I really like the fact that you can, just because I think it makes a portable box more useful if you have Wi-Fi as an option. Now installed in here, we have a MediaTek RZ, 608, which is a pretty like kind of mediocre Wi-Fi 6E solution for being honest. But something that adding Wi-Fi in here introduces is that you need the antenna cables and you also need to go put the antenna somewhere, which complicates ever so slightly putting back together the system, or I guess also taking it apart. But overall, the chassis comes apart pretty easily. And then what you see is that we have our sandwich of two different PCBs. Now the top PCB controls things like our three NICs, and you can see that those NICs are on the little board here. Now, aside from your NIC connectivity, you also have things like your USB ports and also the NVMe or the PCIe lanes that go to the NVMe drives and Wi-Fi and all that kind of stuff. That's all on this top PCB. It's kind of become like the IO PCB or something like that, right? Now, as part of the sandwich, you have two ribbon cables that go between the top and bottom. Now, the bottom one, that's where a lot of the magic happens because that has our processor. It also has our memory. It has things like our power input. And one thing I think they changed a little bit in this generation is how they connect those cables. These things are now have little uh, like covers, so they're more securely in there. And I think that that's really good. I just kind of like the design better in this generation. Now, taking a look at that bottom PCB, something I want to point out is the fact that this system is a little bit different from a lot of the other mini PCs that we look at. And the reason for that is that the RAM is not on an SODIM because an SODIM basically wouldn't fit in this form factor, at least wouldn't fit easily. Instead, we get LPDDR memory on the system itself. So the memory is LPDDR5 and you have to pick at the time of ordering if you want eight gigabytes or 16 gigabytes. I kind of wish that, you know, there was a higher end option, but these are like kind of the older like N series processors. So we got to kind of remember that. But the memory is affixed to the little motherboard here. So you just get stuck with whatever you order. So if you do think you might need 16 gigabytes, I would say just get it. Even if you got like the lower end processor, I just generally would tell people to get the 16 gigabyte version. And on that processor note, you can see that we have our Alder Lake N processor, which in this system is an Intel Core i3 N300. Now that is a super awesome processor. We're gonna get to the performance in a second, but you get a total of eight cores. Now there is an option to get an N95 instead of getting an N300 and you lose half your core count, which that kind of stinks. But on the other hand, the system tends to be about $100 less when you configure it with the N95 versus the 
N300. So I think a lot of folks, you know, if you're gonna look at the system, you're like, oh, it's too expensive. I don't need eight cores or something like that. I'm just trying to replace the Raspberry Pi. Then what you really wanna do is get the N95 version and just save that extra hundred dollars. Now, one of my big complaints with the original R1 was that it was a little bit noisy and the R1 Pro added a copper heat sink, a kind of better fan, and that cooling solution helped a lot with the noise. So on the R2, it seems like we have a similar copper solution. We have a lot more vents around the system and that allows the system to be cooler, but also at a lower noise level. So I really like the fact that they did that on this generation. Now, before we close this up, I just wanna point out that because you can't really service the RAM, that's a something you have to pick when you order the system and also you can't service the processor because that's also soldered on. Well, your only real option is to change out the SSD and maybe add a Wi-Fi card. You do need a screw to be able to secure your SSD and your Wi-Fi card and all that kind of stuff. But to get inside the system, it is actually toolless, which is kind of nice. And it's something that I wouldn't have expected in a system like this, but I'm really glad that that's the design. Okay, with that, let's get to the performance. Now the performance of this is something I was not expecting. Inside you have an Intel Core i3 N300, which is an eight core, eight thread processor. So you don't get hyper threading or anything like that, but it's still an eight core processor. What's more is that even for that eight core processor, the TDP on this is only seven Watts, which is less than one Watt per core of TDP, which is kind of awesome. Now, of course, that's just for the CPU. It doesn't include any of the you know memory or NICs or anything like that. So the overall system power consumption, we'll show you that in a sec, but um, you know, overall though, the CPU just doesn't have, it's just not that high power of a device. And when we tested this little system, the cooling on it is actually pretty good. And as a result, the system performed pretty darn well. It performed pretty close to the old B-Link N305 unit that we reviewed previously. And I was kind of shocked, frankly, with how well this thing performed. Now the previous generation had the older quad core processors, but the new eight core processor, well, there are two things. Like first, the architecture is newer. So you get more performance per core. So your single thread performance goes up, but you also go from four cores to eight cores and you get a lot more performance just by having more newer cores. And so the overall performance is like more than two X what you had in the previous generation. Now we're not going to go into all of the quick sync video performance and all that kind of stuff, but this does have an integrated GPU. So if you do want to run it as a desktop, you could do that. You can run windows on it and all that kind of stuff. But also if you want to use quick sync or something for transcoding, this has that as an acceleration option because there is a little IGPU in this. And just so we're clear, if you're just gonna go run like a pretty simple firewall or a simple just kind of like NAT device or something like that, then, you know, using two of these ports as a, you know, two and a half gig networking, absolutely no problem. You have plenty of CPU horsepower to go push like a two, two and a half gigabit feed like through one NIC and out the other. Easy peasy. The only thing that's a little bit weird is that the two and a half gig Realtek NIC, you know, you're not gonna get the same level of performance out of that as you do the Intel i226. And that's kind of a bummer. Now, one thing I will tell you though, is that you can use that to your advantage in some ways. Like for example, if you're gonna run a operating system and have a hypervisor like Proxmox, or you're gonna run an Ubuntu where you have like a hypervisor, one thing I would definitely do is think about using this Realtek NIC as kind of like a management NIC and then using the i226Vs as your kind of data ones for all your VMs and containers and all that kind of stuff. But if you just want to run a simple OPN Sense, PF Sense, Firewall, you know, you got plenty of performance to go do, you know, one in, one out, two and a half gigabit per second, no problem. But you probably want to know more about the power noise. So let's get to that next. Okay, so let's talk about the power consumption here on the new set for the iCool Core R2. Now you're gonna see that the package power consumption is somewhere in that maybe less than a half a watt range. This is a very low power processor. You're gonna see this in a second. Now, of course, this is idle in Proxmox VE, but the idle power consumption at the low end at idle is about seven and a half watts. And just so you know, the new studio is about a 34 and a half DBA noise floor. And when we have this thing running at idle, I, I frankly can't hear it from this distance. And we have the sound meter up, the 34 and a half goes up to maybe about 35. So it is a very quiet system. There is a fan running. If I put my ear rate up to it, you can definitely hear it. But at this distance, absolutely not. Okay, so something that I thought would be fun is we are now running Stress NG on the system. You can see that the power consumption is significantly higher, but it's not crazy numbers by any means. Okay, so this thing has now been running flat out 100% for around two minutes now. 
And frankly, a couple things have changed. First off, you're gonna see that the package power consumption is now in that like seven to seven and a half watt range. You're gonna see the total power consumption of the system is now somewhere in the 27 to 30 watt range in Proxmox VE. And then the other big thing that you're gonna just notice is the noise or lack thereof. I can kind of hear a fan right now and it's running at about 37-ish dBA maybe a little less than that. This is a super quiet system, and I think that's really due to the Core i3 N300 and not having a higher TDP CPU. But at the same time, you can see we have eight cores here, so this is pretty darn amazing for such a low power system. With that, let's get to our key lessons learned. Now with all of these videos, I like to have a key lessons learned because if we get these systems and we've reviewed tons of them, we should have at least something that we learned from the system. And I can tell you the number one one that I have with this system is that I love this processor. The Intel like N95 that's an option in this is good. It's four quarts. If you just need something that's less expensive, then frankly, I would save the $100 and I would not get the Core i3 N300 that's in here. However, if you do want performance, then the N300 is just flipping awesome. Having a lot of cores without hyper-threading makes it pretty easy to go do virtualization and have a very easy system. This also uses all e-cores, so you don't run into the heterogeneous core issue that you have with like VMware, ESXi, and like modern Intel processors where you have like different, you know, P and E cores. This is all e-cores, so you don't run into that issue at all. Now, while I love the fact that the Intel Core i3 N305 is very fast and it's a low power processor, the system is very quiet, there are a couple things that I'm not a huge fan of. Like the fact that you can only get up to 16 gigabytes of memory. That 16 gigabytes, by the way, is a spec maximum for this processor. So it isn't like, you know, if you went to like 32 gigs, you would be out of spec. And I can understand why if you had a SATA on RAM, you would not go and say like, you know, hey, let's go, let's go test and try doing 32 gigabytes and unsupported configuration, because that just wouldn't make sense. But on the other hand, that also means that you have two gigabytes per core maximum. And if you get only the eight gigabytes with this processor, then you have eight gigabytes of memory and you have eight cores or one gigabyte per core. A lot of systems that we're seeing these days, you know, people are looking at like four gigabytes a core. And so it just feels like the ratio is a little bit off. However, if you do want to maintain four gigabytes per core. Well, then you just get the N95 and you have four cores, 16 gigabytes of memory, and you're set. Now we have been looking at a lot of mini PCs recently. And something that I just freak out in comments when I see is that people are always like, I need way more more performance. I need like a Xeon E5 or a Skylake Xeon or something like that. I need 24 cores in my home lab. Frankly, most of the people that do that, they get these like big servers, they use a ton of power, they have to figure out how to cool them, they spend tons of money on fans, or they just run a loud server or something like that. And then they run these things at CPU utilization that's like 1%, 2%, something like that. It's just atrocious to go and use a giant CPU, burn all that power, and just not really use it, right? So I think for a lot of folks, if you want a home lab node that's not like a workstation or a laptop, and you just want to have like a little home server, this is pretty darn awesome. It gives you all the capabilities of having a server at a low power, low noise. And I just think that that's an awesome combination and you get plenty of NICs. So if you wanna do something like, you know, you wanna use two NICs for your firewall and you wanna have that going. And then you also wanna have another NIC for like your VMs and you wanna have another one for managing the hypervisor. You can do that on a little platform like this, which is always nice to do. To me though, I'm not a huge fan of this real technique. I also don't like the fact that everything is, looks like a USB-C port on it, like the audio, the power input, all that kind of stuff. I would rather just have, you know, the plain ports because I think that makes it easier for just everything. And while I know that there are adapter cables, I don't necessarily want to use them for everything. Now, I think a lot of folks are going to see this and they're going to say, hey, I need more storage. It's just not enough storage for me. And if you have a little node like this, something you can do is you could go get one of these like little external RAID boxes or JBODs. This is this one's from QNAP. We have not done the photos for the STH main site review yet. So uh, the plastic is still on there. So we can, this is a definitely a fingerprint a magnet or whatever. And you know, you get something like this, you can put two hard drives in here. We have, I think like uh, two Western digital, like 20 terabyte drives in here. And so you get 40 terabytes that you can hook up to a little system like this. And it's a relatively compact solution. So I know there are folks that are gonna want storage and that's probably how I would solve that problem. But overall, I have to say, if you just need a little tiny node that you can bring with you anywhere, I, I don't know what is much better than the iCool Core R2 at this point. The R1 Pro is awesome. But on the other hand, the R2 with eight cores is much better. And the fact that you can put Wi-Fi in it is super useful in a portable platform. And hey guys, I hope you like this review. If you did, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.